took the top limit in the super gravity limit, then you see that uh, basically the same limit corresponds to uh, decoupling the, the near horizon region and the, the, the rest of the system. So this rest of the system will agree with the bulk geometry on the left-hand side. So we found the equivalence between the near horizon geometry of this side, which is ADS5 plus S5, and the N equals 4 super young males. So that's the kind of heuristic derivation of this geology. And um, you can repeat the same argument for various other cases. Um, and these are the familiar examples of ADCFP uh, that has been studied like 20 years ago. Well, some of them are like, younger than that. But uh, the most famous one would be D3 brains probing Calabi L3 fold singularities. And that will give you 40 n equals 1 fever gauge theory dual to type 2b on ADS5 plus Sasaki Einstein 5 fold. And uh, M2 brains probing um, the probing orifold singularity C4 mod ZK. Uh, that is uh, going to give you uh, 3dn equals 6 uh, un times un gauge theory, uh, which is called ABJM theory. And um, this is supposed to be dual to M theory, 11 dimensional M theory on ADS4 times 7 sphere. Uh, modded by ZK. You can do the same thing with M5 brains, and that, the, that will give you 62,0 theory dual to M theory on AD7 cross S4. And also D1 and D5 systems will give you N equals 4,4 theory dual to AD3 cross S3, and so on. So this, these are the like most familiar cases and most rigorously checked cases, as far as I know. Uh, but one thing that I, I want to emphasize in today's talk is that the ADS-CFT correspondence really goes beyond these well-controlled cases. So the strong version of ADS-CFT correspondence really asserts that any conformal field theory in D space and dimension has to be dual to some particular quantum gravity theory in anti-digital space in D plus one dimensions. So in this way, that conformal field theory can be thought of as a definition of some particular quantum gravity in ADX. Uh, but the real question is that what sort of quantum gravity for a given CFT, it, that is unclear. It's really, we do not really know uh, what kind of quantum gravity theory it is for if you just give me a random CFT. And this is, uh, the, the gravity side is known for only for a particular cases such as N equals four super young mills, uh, ABJM and some nice quiver gauge theories and so on. So, oh, I, I should really, <laughs> so I cannot really use animation, uh, that's bad. Uh, so the, the rough picture, um, like the bird's eye view would be the following. So among the CFTs, there are theories that is uh, commonly referred to as a holographic CFT, which will give you a Einstein-like gravity dual. And, but uh, this is not the end of the story because the, the set of uh, so-called holographic theory is rather limited. And generic consistent CFT will give you some gravity, quantum gravity theory, but that might be rather exotic. So meaning that uh, you might have very light string states or the, the causal Klein modes can be very light and so on. So you might get something uh, very different from, uh, or ordinary um, gravity theory uh, in the semi-classical regime. And um, also if you just bring me some random uh, gravity theory, uh, like some that makes sense only classically, but then uh, you might actually worry that this might not be part of the, it might, might not be a complete theory of gravity. If you just give me say pure Einstein gravity in five dimensions, then obviously this is not a good theory with UV completion. So um, even if you invoke CFT, that requires you to add in more degrees of freedom, uh, which is basically implied by the bootstrap conditions or, or other um, consistency requirement of the CFT. So I can just loosely refer to it as, as an ADS swamp plant. Um, so uh, 
the interesting question to ask is that when do you have a semi-classical gravity dual? Because then we can uh, reliably use the conformal field theory techniques to learn um, uh, something about the gravitational theory. Um, this question has been um, addressed by many people, uh, most notably by Hemskirk, Benedonis, Pochinski, Sully, and many follow-ups. And there are some uh, important requirements for that. So for a, for a theory to be holographic, uh, meaning that it has a semi-classical gravity dual that looks like Einstein gravity, uh, one zeroth order requirement is that you need to have a large end limit. Uh, you need to have a large degrees of freedom in order to account for the um, gravity in, in, in order to have something that's semi-classical in, in, uh, in the dual picture. So uh, there's some important uh, uh, outcome of that is that we actually typically consider a family of theories parameterized by some number n instead of one particular theory. So in the familiar example of n equals four super young mills versus ADS phi cross S phi, uh, the G string is uh, given by one over n. So since you can freely tune the value of G string, you better have some parameters that I can uh, move around. So typically we want a family of theories parameterized by some number N. And um, this famous paper, this uh, Himskirk et al. paper pointed out that in order to have a local field theory, I mean local field theory in the bulk, you need to have a large gap in the higher spin operators. So that's one um, non-trivial conditions to be satisfied. And also one of the important conditions um, the, you need to have is that you need to have a sparse spectrum at the low energy. Uh, that, that's because that in the, in the gravitational theory side, the main degrees of freedom at low energy should be the propagating um, gravitons and photons and other gauge fields and could be other like massive particles. So you could have a massive particle separated by some things like Kaiser klein scale, but which means that you need to have a, in the sparse spectrum uh, at the low energy um, in, in order to account for the CFT uh, spectrum. I mean, the, I mean, the sparse spectrum in the CFT spectrum accounts for the, the this uh, like particle spectrums in the, in the bulk. And also one of the important feature in ADS gravity in general is the Hawking page phase transition, which means that if you heat up the system, then now your preferred uh, geometry would be the, the, the large ADS black hole. So you, you have to form a large ADS black hole and there's a phase, first order phase transition between the two. Uh, and once, once the black hole is formed, then you have very large degeneracy. So, and that really separates uh, be, like between the, the scale uh, of the black hole and the scale of the, like, the propagating particles. And um, well, in 2D CFT case, uh, it has been actually shown by a very nice paper by um, um, like, what, what are the authors? Um, uh, Christoph Keller and um, uh, Tom Hartman, uh, Hartman, Keller and Stoica, they have shown that the modular inverse actually implies that sp the meaning that sparse spectrum at low energy is equivalent to the Hawking page phase rendition. And also another condition would be that correlators of the low lying operators should factorize. This, is, this can be uh, seen from the computing the Witten diagrams and so on. So these are looks non-trivial conditions, but also it seems that these conditions are always satisfied for large N gauge theories uh, in the tooth clinic. Because uh, for example, the sparse spectrum uh, at the low energy can be easily accounted uh, for by the, the gauge invariant operators. Because like the, you, you're not, you cannot really, uh, the, the low, lower lying uh, modes, they, they are basically given by the gauge invariant operators such as like trace phi squared, trace phi cube, or like baryons. And they are, uh, tend to be, I mean, have the dimensions of like order one. So uh, that seems to be a natural candidate. You, you do not have like a just proliferation of light operators because of the um, gauge invariance and the theory. 
And also uh, for generic gate series, there's confinement, deconfinement, phase transition, which is uh, dual to the Hawking phase transition in ADS gravity. So also the correlators for large end gate series in the tube limit also um, factorizes in general. This is uh, just field theory uh, statement. So now then you might wonder that is the, these conditions, whether these conditions are true for every possible gate series. I mean, that sounds a bit too much to hope for because we know that not all large end gauge series should admit a semi-classical gravity dual. So that seems to be a little bit too much to hope for. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to argue that this is not really the case. Uh, but in order to see that, uh, I want to study uh, ADS quantum gravity by studying um, large N superconform field theories. So I'm trying to uh, now use the ADS CFT correspondence from CFT to learn something about ADS. That's my goal. Um, but uh, it's nice to have supersymmetry to have some better analytic control. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, I'm going to classify all possible 40 supersymmetric gauge series that admits a large end limit. So the classification of 40 superconform field theory is a daunting task, of course. Uh, it's probably not so easy to do. Uh, but if I restrict myself to the case with a large end limit and also uh, restrict myself to gauge series, then this is a actually very tractable problem. It turns out this is almost a group theory. And um, my aim is to, by studying this uh, large set of, well, uh, this possible large and gauge series, then maybe we can hope to learn something about um, something universal in these large and CFTs. So let me uh, begin the, the, uh, my actual procedure. So I mean, I'll be classifying all possible large end gauge series under the possible conditions. So first I will be restricting myself to the simple gauge group. And that means I'm simply restricted to restricting myself to the classical gauge groups, SUN, SO, and SPN, because for other gauge groups, I cannot take large end limit. So this is all, that's good news. And another important physical constraint would be the fixing the flavor symmetry as we take the large end limit. So this, is, this will give you a very important constraint. So uh, if you, the, the most familiar example of superconformal field theory would be the um, super QCD in the conformal window, which is like SUN gauge theory with uh, some number of flavors. But for those cases, now the number of, the, the conformal window actually grows with, uh, with N. The conformal window uh, the number of flavor is like between something like three half NC and three NC. And that's, that's pretty bad for holography because if you take the large N, the, you have to also increase the number of flavors, which means that uh, if there is a gravity dual for SQCD, then the gravity dual should, the, is really weird because now the flavor group is, since flavor group is mapped to the gauge symmetry in the bulk, uh, the, we cannot really fix the gauge symmetry in the bulk. So that's not really a great idea if you want to study holography. You want the gauge symmetry in the bulk to be a fixed one, say um, SU5 or say E8, whatever you'd like, but you want to fix the gauge symmetry. It does not really scale with uh, your value of string coupling. That's totally insane. So that's what I'm going to do. Fixing the flavors. So I want to have a flavor symmetry that is fixed as I take the large end limit. Okay, uh, given those conditions, now the, I'm going to write all possible like matter content and gauge group. And there are ba uh, basic conditions that uh, these theories has to be satisfied. Um, the, the simple, I mean, the most basic condition would be the absence of gauge anomaly. Gauge anomaly should be canceled. And uh, I, the theory has to be asymptotically free, should have negative beta function. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be an interacting theory. And it turns out these two, two conditions uh, like restrict the matter, matter representations to be either fundamental 
adjoint, symmetric, or anti-symmetric. Anything beyond that, you cannot really have asymptotically free gauge theory in the large end. I mean, for example, um, you could have like an index three tensor for low rank gauge group while uh, keeping the asymptotic freedom. But if you take the large end limit for index three tensor, then it will quickly um, overrun the, the effect of the, uh, it, it will quickly just shift the sign to negative. So it, it's going to have a negative, well, it, it will make render the beta function to be positive so that it will become IR free in the large end. So you, 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 you're only allowed to have a fundamental, basically like one index tensor or two index, uh, one index representation or two index representations. Anything beyond that, uh, the beta function contribution will scale as bigger than n squared. So that's bad. So we have, pretty simple set of uh, theories to consider. And uh, now also it's non-trivial to check that these uh, given matter content flows to uh, super conformal theories. That's not always obvious. So we should also check if this is the case. Um, okay, so in order to have a super conformal fixed point, uh, there are several necessary conditions. Um, the, the important thing is that you should have a non-anomalous UNR symmetry, uh, which is part of the superconformal group in, um, in 40, uh, which means that I should have a trace R T A T V to be zero. And this is also essentially a group theoretic condition. And due to the superconformal symmetry, the conformal anomalies are fixed by the uh, trace anomalies involving R. Uh, this is famous formula for the A and C center charges, given in terms of trace R cube and trace R. Uh, the important thing, uh, important caveat or uh, subtle point is that the R symmetry of, of your uh, superconformal theory is not always determined by the anomaly constraint. This is probably not enough because there can be several different candidate R symmetries that satisfy this constraint. But there can be only one uh, R symmetry uh, in the infrared, and that is fixed uh, through a maximization procedure. That is to uh, compute the trial A function using several linear combinations of R, and, and then pick the one that, minim uh, that maximize uh, this function A. So this is a well-known thing. Uh, I have one question. Yes. Can you consider some Kriber gauge theory? Sure. Like yeah. Bifundamental and so on. Uh huh. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, of to, okay, so in previous slides, you just restrict as a fundamental and also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so because I'm, I'm restricting myself to just simple gauge group. Oh, okay. So only sing, single gauge group, you mean? Yeah, only single gauge group. Okay, so, but it, in general, you have to consider Kuiper gauge theory. Right, right. That, that's also important constraint. If you consider Kuiper gauge, Kuiper gauge theory, then bifundamental. Bifundamental is mm. uh, the, I mean, there are, also there are the severe restrictions on the matter content and bifundamental is another like allowed representation. Uh-huh, okay. But you cannot have, um, tri-fundamental is a bad thing to have. Oh, okay, I see. But you, you, you need to take the, the rank to be the same for all the gauge group. Not necessarily. Uh, well, that's not a necessary condition. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. I mean, you, you could have a different rank, but still, uh, like, I mean, the, the one, one simple example would be like N2, like Kuber gauge theory of N2, okay. N3, N4, N, okay. N, all the way up to M times N, okay. and then you can take large M. Okay. That's totally fine. Okay. So, so if you consider a situation that uh, you have a Kuber of three gauge groups, mm -hmm. and two of the ranks are large and one is small, and then in that case, you can have tri is that right? Uh, well, the, the tri-fundamental is kind of bad because um, that, so, so for, for a given matter, uh, so tri-fundamental means that the matter, so if you decouple, say, two of the gauge groups, then the, you have n square of fundamentals. Uh -huh. That's too many as you increase oh. that. The tri-fundamental is good only for a very low rank. Actually, the, for tri-fundamentals, SU2 is the only case that, it, that gives you anything that's good. Uh, yeah, I see. 
Okay. So yeah. But then what's the difference between adjoint? So adjoint also scale like n square degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah, but the tri fundamental is n cube. Really. Oh, but but if I consider a case that say uh, u n times u n times uh, say u three, mm -hmm. in this case, then I can have tri fundamental. Is that right? Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thanks. Um, well, uh, if, even though I, 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 I would like to have, well, NN2 would be better because NN3 will make the gauge group to be IR3. Okay, so, <laughs> so you and times you and times you too then. Yeah, that's probably the only case I can think of. Um, you know, even that, yeah, that might be okay. Yeah, that might be still in the conform window. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, okay, no, but that, that will render U2, SU2 to be IR3. <laughs> uh, okay. So there is a delicate balance that, that makes it really difficult to have anything beyond high fundamental for a, a prior theory. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, so um, in, in, the, in this analysis of A-maximization, there's important caveat that is very important in all of the discussion that follows, is that um, there can, uh, the A-maximization can fail um, superficially if there is an accidental symmetry. If, if there's an accidental symmetry along the RG flow that we cannot, we do not identify, then the, you, you will get a wrong answer. Um, so, Indeed, in many of the, the examples that we study, uh, we'll have uh, accidental symmetry. But luckily for the theories, uh, the, for, for our theories, it turns out these accidental symmetries arises from um, like decoupling of operators along the RG flow. So what happens is that it, uh, sometimes if you do the AMX maximization procedure, you uh, might encounter some operator, gauge invariant operator that violates unitarity. So any unitary field theory should have the, the operator dimensions for car operators greater than one. Uh, so sometimes you get, you seem to get delta that is less than one. And um, in order to remedy this, uh, the, the possible scenario is that along the renormalization group flow, uh, it starts with the operator dimension large. And then typically along the RG flow, like anomalous dimension will push dimension uh, to be smaller. So like along the RG flow, it will it start from uh, delta bigger than one and it hits delta equals one. And at that point it becomes free and then decouples from the rest of the system. So that is a, a plausible scenario in which we believe that is happening. And then uh, we can remove that and, and do the maximization again to, to remedy the previous complications. And we do this over and over until uh, we find every operator is based couple. And um, this procedure can be uh, efficiently implemented by introducing so-called free field and a superficial coupling that goes like this, x times o. Uh, then the, the f term condition for the x will set uh, o to be zero in the chiral ring. Or this is like a mass term for the o because this is a quadratic coupling. So this is a way to get rid of this decoupled operator along the RG flow. So that's kind of technical part. So here is the full list of uh, SUN theories that with large n. So these are, uh, but I'm telling you that, so these, this list does not include SQCD. So you should uh, <laughs> yell at me that SQCD is also valid CFT. But uh, it does not have a good, good uh, large n limit that, that I hope to have. So if I relax that condition, then presumably you can have more theories than just uh, this set of theories. Okay, so then there are how many, uh, uh, I forgot how to count. Like there, there are four of, so I have divided into two classes. Uh, there are four of them in the above and the rest of them are in the, in the bottom. Uh, and they have two distinct features, uh, which I'm going to explain later. And among these, there are uh, n equals two and n equals four theories, uh, of course. 
no big deal. And there's also SO and SP entries. Um, there's all, one of them is n equals two. Oh, actually, the, the, this is n equals four. Um, this one and this one are n equals four. So in total, there are 35 of them. Um, and I have singled out eight of them to be in the special, um, uh, that, that requires special treatment. So let me give you the simplest example uh, among, among that, so which is at the top of the list, this one, which has one adjoint and the NF, um, let's first start with one fundamental and anti-fundamental. So uh, this will be the simplest one, and it has a matter content of the following. So one fundamental, one anti-fundamental, and one adjoint. That's it. It's a very simple theory. Uh, you can work it out. Uh, this theory has two U1 symmetries uh, besides R, or one we call U1 baryonic, and one we call U1 axial, uh, so with following charges. And the R charge is, R charge is not fixed by the uh, by the anomaly constraint, it has to be fixed using the AMX language. Uh, and this theory has a uh, following gauging bearing operators. Uh, as far as I know, this is a complete set. Uh, it has a uh, so-called uh, Coulomb branch operators given by trace phi to the n. And it has a mesonic operator, uh, like Q phi, phi to the n, Q tilde, which is neutral under B. That's why it's called baryon. And there's also a baryon, uh, which carries uh, B charge is given by contracting Q, phi Q, phi square Q, all the way up to phi n to n minus one Q. And there's also anti barrier. And well, it looks like any other gauge theory with a sparse low line spectrum, right? Because I mean, engineering dimension of Q and phi's are all one. So it seems like this operator should have dimension n, well, n plus two or whatever, uh, this will have a slightly larger have the super potential for this theory. Oh, I, I'm turning off the super potential. So it's zero. Okay. It's zero. Okay. Thank you. And uh, it's quite non trivial to argue that, well, to show that this theory indeed flows to a super component fixed point in the IR. Uh, that's our claim. Uh, but uh, there's there's a caveat, important caveat is that it flows to a supercompound fixed point, but with a number of decoupled free field. There may be a number of decoupled free field. Uh, and these decoupled free fields are nothing but these Coulomb branch operators, trace phi to the power and dress mesons Q tilde phi Q for some low value of I. And it turns out that none of the baryons are uh, decoupled. And it turns out the, the mass dimension of the baryon is of order n. So I mean, technically, these decoupled free fields can be taken care uh, taken care of by introducing the flip field uh, and just get rid of them. So we'll ignore this decoupled free field. But now the really interesting feature of this theory is the following. First of all, the central charge central charges for this theory grows linearly in N. So this is our numerical result that central charge A is proportional to N, C is also proportional to N. Uh, this is really weird because I, I started with a gauge theory and for a gauge theory, it's natural to expect that the, the central charges grow linear uh, quadratically in N because I mean the central charge measures are degrees of freedom. So uh, it's, you should have a matrix figures of freedom given by n square. But here we got n instead of n square. What the hell is going on here? So it's pretty weird. Uh, and here's a plot of a over c. And it seems that a over c uh, gets pretty close to one, but uh, it seems that it doesn't really approach to one exactly. So this is one. Another interesting feature. And even more uh, exciting feature Sorry, is. Could you, could you go back um, 
Okay, so I thought um, there are some argument by, I think, Harman, maybe Malasena, about that A over C should be one for holographic CFT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A over C for uh, like strictly holographic theory, it, had, it better be one. Uh -huh. So I, I didn't assume any holographic. I mean, I didn't assume that this theory is holographic. So I was, I'm just starting with the simple gauge theory and see, see. if uh, it's good. Okay, thanks. Uh, Uh, well, but, but, but I can add one more comment because like the, it is okay to have different value of A and C uh, because the difference between A and C gives you a higher order corrections. I think that has to do with a uh, higher curvature, um, like R to the fourth cor corrections um, mm. uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the effective action. So it's okay. I see. Yeah. I see. Oh, I, okay. I guess the statement is just that if the bulk duo is Einstein gravity, then you need to have A yeah, over yeah, C right, plus right. one. But yeah, but, exactly. okay. Good. Thanks. So, um, and this theory has also uh, the following very surprising feature: it has a dense spectrum of, of operator dimensions. So the, this uh, horizontal axis is n, the rank of the H-group, and the vertical axis is the dimension, uh, conformal dimensions of operators. So here I listed the operators for a, give, for a given n. And it turns out that dimensions form a very um, dense band between one and three. So if you increase n, then it will just form almost a line uh, being dense. And it turns out that uh, if you look at closely, these operators, uh, these are the operators given by trace phi to the, the Coulomb branch operators and the Mizani operators. But, but here the power i has to be uh, a bit large and it, it has to be larger than particular value because for lower value of i, it actually gets decoupled. So uh, you need to introduce uh, flip fields for that. And that, that fills uh, this upper region. So it turns out there are two bands, like lower band and upper band. And upper bands are filled by the flip fields for trace phi. And the lower bands is filled by trace phi and the Q phi Q. So this is very interesting. And the reason behind this is that the R charge for the phi actually scales one over N, which is a very surprising feature. R charge for Q is mostly constant, uh, like plus one, one over N corrections, but R charge for the phi goes all the way up to nearly zero. So that's why you get a dense spectrum. Because of like all the gauge invariant operators, you just stack the number of phi's. So this is a very peculiar feature. Uh, and as far as I know, I have never seen a higher dimensional field theory was such a dense spectrum. I mean, in the lower dimensions, there's new field theory, which have a continuous spectrum. But uh, in higher dimensions, I haven't, I haven't seen such a case. And uh, I, to, to, my best, to, to the best of my knowledge, this is the closest analog of Louisville theory in higher dimensions. I might be wrong, but um, it is very different from Louisville theory, but it looks uh, tantalizing. Um, and well, sometimes I kind of like love to call this as a like supersymmetric uh, analog of uh, the band theory in the, <laughs> the theory of semiconductors because you have a band and there's a gap. So <laughs> uh, but that that's probably a wrong analogy. So there's. I can slightly generalize uh, this computation with uh, adding one more fundamental. That, that changes the story a little bit uh, because now we have a secondary band. Uh, that, so here there's a blue band, uh, which is direct analog of this. But then there is another band uh, that is the red band, so which is larger. And now the size of this band is of ON, where the size of this blue band is just O1. And there's a gap which, which grows as uh, linear in N. So yeah, this is kind of interesting. Uh, here, the secondary band is formed by the baryons uh, because there, there are like uh, many different baryons in this theory. 
compared to NF equals one. So this is kind of interesting and very peculiar. Um, I think in view of time, I can skip this. So uh, you can consider other, like other examples. And uh, one of the examples would be Argyros Douglas theory, actually. And they, they, they exhibit the same uh, qualitative behavior as this. So then I can just skip that. So uh, in our classification of 35 gauge, large N gauge theories, eight of them have uh, such a behavior of dense spectrum. Can I ask a question, please, on the previous slide? To flow to a stack last, you need to turn on uh, another flipping for the meson, if I remember correctly. Or yeah, 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 right. So then you, no, but you, you, so you keep zero superpotential, or you, you want to turn on superpotential? Uh, well, for, for this theory, I'm, I'm just considering the Arjo Stokos theory, which means that I have to flip all the Coulomb branch okay. operators okay. and the mesons. In this case, you, you, you turn it on specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here I have. I have turned on the, the flip deformations for all. Now, my for question is also that uh, suppose in the previous example, you turn on uh, superpotential like um, uh, with a soft swimmer. Sorry. With a soft swimmer, right? Yeah, the trace phi to the k. Mm -hmm. You still get the, this band or this kind of thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. You do get the band. So even if I don't turn on, I mean, so, so, if I turn on just this part, right, I I still get a get a dense band, uh, mm -hmm. and and actually for even if I just turn on this thing, some of the mesons will start to decouple. That's also another thing, <laughs> right? So in some sense, we are forced to add this type of the term to see the IRCFT. Uh, but the point is that the, for generic gauge theory, this thing doesn't have to go up all the way up to n minus one. So that's mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the difference. Okay, I see. So for for actually for these theories, um, for these theories, the this flip flip deformation it doesn't have to go up all the way up to n. It typically goes something like three over n, uh, n over three, I think. Okay, I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but anyway, th this is a nice example because you can actually work out everything analytically. Um, there, you see that the uh, um, scaling dimensions of the gauge invariant operators. In this case, uh, M and X are the gauge invariant operators. They have dimensions uh, N um, and, well, they, 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 they have, yeah. So they, they do form a band between one and three. So you can explicitly check this. And the central charge also grows linearly in N, as you can see here. But for this example, A over C goes to one in our gen. So that's a little bit, it's a little bit well behaved compared to the previous example. All right, so uh, I think I should speed up. So uh, the out of 35, eight of them has dense spectrum, uh, either of this fashion uh, with like a very dense band in the low line and the sparse spectrum at the, at the high energy or like dense, like two distinct dense bands. Uh, but the 27 of them will have a sparse spectrum at low energy with where the gap is of order one. Like the trace phi square, trace phi cube, trace phi to the four, they have uh, the, the dimension of the phi is roughly of order one. It doesn't really scale too much with n. So they are qual qualitatively very different. So, okay. Now the dense model does not seem to satisfy uh, the criterions to have a semi-classical gravity dual. So it's, it has a dense spectrum. So, so you, you break the one of the conditions to have a sparse. It better have a sparse spectrum. Uh, but very interestingly, well, we know that ADS-CFT really tells you that it has to be dual to some quantum gravity in ADS. Uh, it, how it might be quite crazy looking, but it has to be dual to some ADS bulk theory. So the question is that what kind of bulk theory uh, it is? And unfortunately, I do not know an answer to this. Um, but uh, I, I can tell you something that it still satisfies a uh, certain property that is believed to be true in any theory of quantum gravity. Well, it is conjectured to be true, uh, which is the, the weak gravity conjecture. Um, so. The statement of the weak gravity conjecture is that it asserts that 
uh, there has to be a, for any consistent theory of quantum gravity, there has to be a light charged particle that allows uh, certain the, the extreme extreme of black holes to decay um, so that we do not have any absolutely stable remnants. So the, this absolutely stable remnants will create lots of problems. So we don't want to have that. So the, the, the extreme of black holes, you um, allow certain channels for the external black holes to decay. Uh, in ADS-CFT, um, uh, the statement of weak gravity conjecture can be translated into the existence of a operator where the ratio of scaling dimension and charges to be smaller than certain uh, bounds. So um, this is worked out by Nakayama and Nomura, Nomura some time ago. So the scaling dimension over uh, charge it carries is bounded up, uh, by the, the ratio of the central charges. So CT is the roughly um, central charge C with different normalization. And CV is the flavor central charge, uh, like something like trace R F square. Now we can check this weak gravity conjecture for our um, dense model. And it turns out it works. The, Meaning that, um, so the, the red line is the bound uh, put by the, uh, imposed by this condition, the, the, this nine over 40 CP over CV. So the, that's the red curve. And the blue curve is the uh, charge to mass, well, mass to charge ratio for a certain um, charged operator. So I need to find some operator that satisfy this bound. Then, uh, it allows extremal black holes decay by emitting this particle. So it works for the for this U1A symmetry, and you can do the same thing with the U1B uh, that is now satisfied by the baryon operator in the theory. So indeed, even though this theory is highly non-holographic, well, it's non-Einstein, it's uh, still the weak graphic conjecture is satisfied. That's pretty remarkable because the original argument of the weak gravity conjecture or any other possible proof uh, set forth in the literature really uh, relies on semi-classical um, uh, like analysis of the gravity. But uh, this is highly quantum and stringy, but nevertheless, weak gravity conjecture seems to hold. Um, I think I can skip that. So for when, when there are multiple U1s, uh, you need to actually invoke slightly more refined analysis. Uh, that's called the convex hull condition. Uh, I think I can just skip that. Um, the, for example, for our theory uh, with SUN with one adjoint, with one flavor, this theory had two U1s, what that we call U1A and U1B. And uh, there, uh, I need to find some set of particles that uh, uh, surrounds this uh, unit circle or unit ball uh, in, the, in the charge to ratio plane. So whenever I can construct such a polygon, uh, the convex hull, then it satisfies the more refined version of the weak gravity conjecture. So we worked out this for several examples and uh, for this theory, SGN with one symmetric and NF equals one, this is uh, ha has a three, uh, three different U1s and uh, need to draw a, a three-dimensional convex hull to check this. And indeed it works. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's good, but why the hell this uh, weak graphic conjecture should be true in a non-holographic theory, which is really totally bizarre. Uh, as I told you already, that the, the argument for the weak graphic conjecture is from semi-classical reasoning based on like arguing from the black hole evaporation. But for our theory, it's not even clear whether there is a such thing called black holes. So, I mean, that means that the weak gravity nature doesn't have to hold for a generic CFT. There's no obvious reason. For holographic theory, there are many different reasons for it to hold, but gener generic CFT, not really. Uh, but there's one clue in uh, ADS3 because uh, in AJS3, it is, it is supposed to be dual to conformal field theory in two dimensions, and their modular invariance imposes a severe constraint on the spectrum of the theory. And indeed, um, there are a few works that demonstrate that the modular bootstrap 
actually allows you to argue in favor of weak gravity conjecture. Uh, but is it still the case in higher dimensional CFT or higher dimensional ADS? It seems it's not the case, actually. Uh, in the original paper by Nakayama and Nomura, they have actually found a counterexample to the weak gravity conjecture. Simply, it's a SQCD in the Venetiano limit, taking the large n of the, the, the conformal SQC, SQCD in the conformal window. Uh, it has a large n limit when you fix the number of colors and flavors to be fixed. But uh, as I said in the earlier part of the talk, that this is probably not a good limit to take if you have in mind in program. It's probably not a good family of theories you should think of. But nevertheless, if you pick certain value of NC and NF uh, in the conformal window, indeed, uh, they, they were not able to find uh, the operator that satisfied the weak gravity conjecture. So, so it's not clear uh, if the weak gravity conjecture holds in arbitrary theory or not. So uh, let me skip this example. So uh, we have found actually another example that seems to uh, have this have the problem. So. I so originally we thought that it's probably the the bad limit that caused the problem of this. The, um, about the weak gravity conjecture. So we thought that all of our theories uh, in the, the proper large n limit should satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. But unfortunately, we, found, we also found a counterexample. So one of the examples uh, is this, SCON with one symmetric and one TNT symmetric. Uh, with fundamental anti fundamental. This is a chiral gauge theory uh, exhibiting dense spectrum. And it turns out that we could not find a set of chiral operator that satisfied a weak gravity conjecture if the value of n, rank of gauge group, is small. So, uh, in, so it either means that we are not clever enough or uh, something. Uh, it might say something deep about the nature of weak gravity conjecture. So uh, the, their like, possible interpretation of our result, the, one of the result is that, well, one of the possible interpretation is that there is an operator that we are missing in the non-BPS sector, which makes the weak gravity conjecture valid. So due to technical limitations, we are only looking at the BPS sector. So here, uh, the BPS sector, some of them satisfy the weak gravity conjecture, but these ones are the one that fails to satisfy the constraint. So the one way out is that weak gravity conjecture is, is still true for generic CFT, but it means that there has to be an operator in the non-BPS sector that we do not know how to compute. So that's one option. And the second option is that the weak gravity conjecture might hold for a, um, if you come up with a like, modification in some sense. So may, there might be a weaker version of the weak gravity conjecture that still holds for generic CFT that, that I don't know how to formulate. Or another possibility is that the weak gravity conjecture simply cease to hold at highly quantum and stringy region. So this might be the case, and we cannot really uh, pinpoint exactly what uh, interpretation is true. Um, so before, uh, like, um, uh, before um, finishing my talk, let me just make a few comments on the landscape of holographic theories. So that most of the known, well-known holographic gauge theories are of Hubert type. So we classified all possible simple gauge groups, the theories with simple gauge groups, and among them, actually, there are very few Actually, there's only one theory that has known holographic dual, which is n equals four super young mills. Uh, the, all the other theories, even though it has far spectrum and looks good enough, it doesn't uh, have a, they are not really uh, understood in the string theory picture. And uh, in the string theory picture, the best known case are the Kuber gauge theories or non Lagrangian theories, like class S theories or the, the rank N F theory CFTs, like H0, H1, H2, D4, E6, 7, 8. 
they, they can be realized in the F theory. Uh, but here the caveat is that none of these theories except for the D4 is really um, classical. It is string D. So uh, it's rather rare to find a holograph the holographic case theories are rather rare. And actually one important thing that I have overlooked here is that there's an ambiguity of choosing this parameter n in the, in the holographic scale. So I have taken large n limit of the simple gauge group, but is that a good large n limit to get a holographic? Uh, so the, for example, if you can think of this H0 theory. H0 theory is A1 comma H1 theory in other literature, uh, other nomenclature. Uh, and I can take large n of this. So which is close to what, what I've been doing. So it's, it can be realized in terms of SPN gauge theory. But on the other hand, you can consider rank n H0 theory, which is realized by stacking n number of D3 brains probing F theory singularity. And that looks perfectly good, um, holog holographic theories, uh, except that it is it has some string D behavior. So uh, there's basically just two different ways to take large n. One is to go through large n rank uh, rank n h0 theory, or take the a1 comma a2n, and they are not the same. So in one direction it seems to be holographic, but in the other direction it seems you're going away from being holographic. So it's kind of ambiguous. Okay, that was, that was my uh, last comment. And let me summarize today's talk. So uh, I have shown you that there exists an exotic large N gauge series uh, with ON degrees of freedom and has a dense low lying spectrum. And it turns out that such large N gauge series are very simple to construct and quite common. Um, and from there, uh, we try to extract the, the features of quantum gravity uh, by studying the large N CFT. And some of them, actually many of them, goes beyond the semi-classical Einstein gravity. But still, we were able to um, confirm that the weak gravity conjecture holds for many of these theories. So there's a chance that the weak gravity conjecture is a generic feature of quantum gravity, uh, even though it's uh, originally obtained by semi-classical reasoning. Maybe there we need some proper uh, corrections to it, but seems weak gravity conjecture <coughs> is much more powerful than um, just uh, recoupling design. And there are many uh, future directions we can try to uh, proceed. And for most of these, personally, is that I'm really curious that if there's any bulk interpretation of this model with ON scaling. Um, one, uh, so this kind of reminds me of, you know, that uh, if you have a dense spectrum, like continuum spectrum, that sounds like you are going, you're unrolling extra dimensions. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that reminds me of this, uh, like, appearance of 11, 11 dimensions in M theory, or like six dimensions in 5D maximal super young mill theory. I'm not sure whether that's the correct interpretation, but it's, I wonder. And it'll be nice to prove or disprove some uh, weak gravity conjecture in anti digital space. Uh, and the, the, it's interesting to study the phase structure of the model. I, I'm not sure whether these uh, ON models exhibit Hawking page type or confined, confinement, deconfinement type phase transitions. It's not clear because it's not uh, like the ordinary gauge theory that we know and love. So it's quite peculiar. It, it'll be nice to know that. Uh, and I also explained that this notion of large n-limit is rather arbitrary and I'm not sure what, what would be the correct way to characterize it. And uh, also importantly, we can work out the quiver gauge series, which should be the, which should be much more useful and interesting, I think. And I think uh, we can repeat the same analysis in 3D theories. Uh, which would be more relevant to our nature uh, because we live in four-dimensional space-time. So uh, I'd love to know if uh, same feature holds in ADS4. Uh, that's all I have, and thank you very much. Um, questions?
Um, so I have a, a comment about the, the theory with dense spectrum. So uh, yes. um, a while ago, Xin and I, we had a paper uh, study the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence of the W amino model. Uh -huh. And in that model, we also found um, there is a dense spectrum. And oh. um, our interpretation um, is also that um, there is one extra uh, dimension. So our proposal it, it, it was that the W amino model is due to um, ADS3 times an, an extra S1. And, and that S1 is responsible for the, the, the dense spectrum. I see. Now the S1, the size of S1 is very large. Uh, yes, yes. So that's very good. Yeah, I, roughly I the size of, is of all the N. Ah, very good. So that, yeah, that, that's very similar to what I have here. Uh, yeah, I can point to you the, my, my paper. Uh, yeah, yeah that would be great. Thank you. And I have also a question about um, the, the central charges. So, mm -hmm. so you, you show some example that the, uh, some of the A and C scale with N instead of N square. So, uh, yes. so, so those examples are, are, are the example of a dense spectrum or a sparse spectrum? They are all dense. So oh, I, uh, I didn't explain, but uh, whenever, so th there's a, um, I mean, so here for the dense theories, I have shown you three different, well, I mean, I, okay three or two different characters. One is that there's a one degrees of freedom and the theories with one degrees of freedom, meaning the central charge grows linearly. Mm -hmm. And they, all of, the, all of them have dense spectrum in large N. Mm -hmm. It yeah. seems that these two uh, features are sort of like imp one implies the other. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the gauge theories, we can actually argue that this, that is the case. So, so uh, usually if you have the, the scaling, the, the ON scaling, that mm -hmm. usually um, um, suggests that um, your model is vector-like model instead of a matrix-like model. And um, have, have, you, have you looked for like the higher spin uh, current, if there is some higher spin, I mean, maybe approximately a higher spin operator. I mean, uh, so, well, I mean, so those could, could they, I, I guess that there could be some, some operators that uh, are higher spin and approximately conserve, meaning that their, their dimension is just like one over n above the unitarity bound. Oh, okay. Like approximately, okay. Just, just yes. I, yes. Yeah, I, was, I, I thought that, okay, this is strongly interacting theory as, as a 40 mm -hmm. theory. So that means that I thought, okay, the, any higher spin currents should, should make the theory free. So I can. I, right. I, but, but, but since you can have very small gap, there could be approximately conserved higher speed that, that's, that's a good point. I, I'll have a look at it. Yeah, this was actually what we, we, we saw in the W minimum model. So in W minimum model, they are exactly conserved higher spin currents, but they are also approximately conserved higher spin currents mm -hmm. because of the spectrum is dense and, and the gap can be of, all the, of, of one over n. So, so rows higher spin operated are just uh, one of uh, the dimension is just um, very close to a unitary bound, but, but like one of them larger. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm. Oh, very good. Okay. Uh, that, that's something that I've been looking for. <laughs> yeah, let me, yeah let I mean, like, some there's uh, some, I mean, qualitative difference between the ON vector models in the ADS4 is that we don't, we, we do not, I mean, they're, um, I mean, listen to this Polyakov's model that they, they have a, uh, I mean, you really have the, uh, the, I mean, the vec um, I mean, ON vector fields and then uh, impose the, the Gauss law constraint. But in, in our case, we don't have like uh, that many fields. So mm -hmm. like, the number of fields are still like N square. Uh, but somehow, I mean, there's a, there seems to be some delicate translation that gets rid of the n square. Yeah. Uh, um. Any other questions?
Okay, if not, let's thank the J1 again. Bye. Um, <laughs> so somehow I, in the middle, I, uh, I could start recording. <laughs> so I was oh, recording. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then.